je lance l'enregistrement. Je ne sais plus pourquoi elle ne fait même pas la petite voix. Euh, ce séminaire va être enregistré. Bref, tu peux y aller. Ok, thank you very much. Uh, I'll now present you the results that uh, I've obtained, obtained during my PhD that I did at LMA in Marseille um, under the supervision of uh, Philippe Guimain, uh, Jean-Baptiste Doc, who's at the CNAM, and uh, Christophe Verzet, who you surely know, who's at LMA as well. And uh, my PhD dealt with uh, the numerical simulation of the dynamics of the reed instruments, in particular the saxophones. And uh, I'll start by presenting the context of my PhD, uh, which is, uh, the assistance to instrument making and in particular the development of uh, new instrument prototypes. So the way this works usually is uh, you have a luthier uh, who proposes a prototype and uh, then a musician is going to try this prototype and give feedback to the luthier uh, based on uh, his or her playing experience. Uh, the problem with that classical process uh, is that the feedback of the musician can be complex and subjective. So this makes the process potentially very long, uh, sometimes several years, and in unpredictable uh, with uh, tens of prototypes uh, sometimes before arriving at the final satisfactory ver version of the instrument. So the question is, as scientists, where in this process and maybe facilitate it and uh, the good news is um, we have new tools numerical tools in particular uh, that open the door to accelerations of uh, the conception process such as the optimization numerical optimization tools uh, and we also have new tools that allow for a better understanding of the instruments uh, such as uh, the physical models that we can use and uh, some measurements that we can perform on real instruments. And my personal approach is uh, in between these two axes. Uh, it's based on physical model and uh, I aimed at better understanding the instruments in order to accelerate the conception process. So uh, my approach can be summarized in these two questions. First, the underlying question is, how can we quantify the effect of the geometry of the saxophone on the sound that it produces? So that's a classical, let's say, luthier instrument maker question. And it's a very vast uh, question. And so to give elements uh, of answer to this question first, we have to deal with the preliminary question that I've written uh, on the slide, which is for first for a saxophone of given geometry, how can we describe objectively the types of sound that, it, that are produced depending on the action of the musician? Um, and uh, let me specify some things uh, in this problematic. So when I say produce sounds, I first hear very large categories such as silence or a note or the octave of that note. Um, and when I say, depending on the action of the musician, uh, we know very few things about the action of the musician. Uh, we only know that it can be very, uh, very variable. It can widely vary depending on what the musician does. And so what we're gonna aim at here is revealing the potential of the instrument uh, what the instrument can do when a musician takes it and explores um, the potential of the instrument. So um, we, that is to say we don't make a priori assumption on the control of the musician, as little as possible anyway. So to deal with these questions, we have tools that I'm going to talk about here. And the tools that I used are numerical tools of analysis of the model. And the model that I used uh, gives access to the oscillating regimes of the instruments, uh, that is its sound. And um, the numerical nature of these tools um, entails that they are easy to control and uh, highly repeatable. 
Uh, also, the model, the physical model that I use is adjusted a priori uh, using measurements, acoustical measurements and geometrical me measurements performed on real instruments. And also certain results will be validated by exploring the playing situation with an instrument in mouthpiece. So now I'll give uh, a structure of the presentation. First, uh, I'll get into some depth on the saxophone model and uh, the numerical tools and some of the experimental tools that, was, that I've used uh, during my PhD. Uh, then I'll explain how these tools can be of help in exploring the dynamics of the saxophone and describing it. And um, in a final section, I'll try to make a step towards virtual prototyping and uh, applying all these results to instrument making. Okay, so first let's look at the model of the saxophone uh, and the numerical tools. Uh, I'm going to describe the model of the saxophone and uh, to model an instrument or any physical system really, uh, what we first do is we decompose it in, into different elements. And so for a saxophone, what uh, we have is uh, first the reed channel. So I'm going to show on a real saxophone that I, that I have here, I'm going to show it to the camera. So the reed channel is right there and it opens and closes. And when it opens and closes, uh, what it does is it controls the airflow, the flow rate that enters the mouthpiece of the instrument. Uh, then we have the reed itself, which is a mechanical object and uh, it can vibrate. And when it vibrates, um, it controls the height of the reed channel. And then we have the largest part of the instrument, which is the resonator. Let me show it at the camera once again. So it's the largest part of the instrument, this shiny thing. And more precisely, it's the air column inside the resonator that we are interested in. And uh, this air column has resonances and these resonances are going to condition which notes are playable when you play the instrument. And uh, what we do when we play the saxophone is we act on the keys of the instrument. So we plug some holes there, which changes the length and the global geometry of the air column. And uh, this changes the resonances and in turn changes the notes that we can play. So now that I've described the elements, uh, in order to get a physical model, we must associate a physical law to each element. And um, as you can see on this, uh, on this block diagram here, um, I didn't talk about a very important element of the model, which is the musician. And what the musician is going to do here is uh, control the rest of the elements um, via control parameters here, gamma and zeta, that I'm going to talk about a bit later on. And by this control, it, uh, the musician acts on this feedback loop here and this feedback loop uh, can produce um, sounds, can oscillate under certain conditions, can oscillate and produce sounds. So now I'll explicitly give the equations of the model. First, let's look at the musician. So uh, the action of the musician is represented quite simplistically by two parameters, dimensionless parameters. The first is called gamma, and it depends on the blowing pressure of the musician. And the second one is called zeta, and it depends on the reed opening at rest. And this classical representation of the action of the musician uh, allows us to compare our results with uh, some of the well-known results of the classical literature. Um, then we'll look at the reed. So the reed um, is driven by and it's uh, submitted to a difference in pressure between the mouth of the musician and the mouthpiece. And so this pressure difference uh, uh, writes gamma minus P. And uh, the position of the reed is uh, represented by the position of an oscillator uh, with one degree of freedom and uh, one particularity of this oscillator is that its position is limited by 
a contact force that I call FC here. And the contact force represents the action of the table on the reed. When the reed is deformed here and comes up to here, its displacement is limited by the table of the mouthpiece. Uh, then we have the airflow coming into the mouthpiece that I call U here. And uh, the airflow is determined by a nonlinear characteristic uh, derived from Bernoulli's law. And um, this nonlinear characteristic uh, has zeta, so that's a control parameter right there. Uh, of course, the opening of the read channel here, x plus 1, and the pressure difference, gamma minus p. Then we have a resonator. And um, to represent uh, the role of the resonator, we use a linear quantity here, which is the impedance, the input impedance. And the input impedance represents the acoustical response of the resonator by uh, giving the response in pressure P to a given flow excitation U there at the input of the resonator. And on this impedance, uh, we can see the resonances. They are displayed here on this curve by the peaks. And uh, what we'll do to, uh, to use this impedance in the physical model is uh, we'll decompose it into modes. And each mode is going to correspond to a resonance here. And what we have on this curve is a measured impedance in black and three different modal decompos decomposition uh, in color, just overlaid. Uh, what we can see also here is that the second resonance uh, right there is at a frequency that's about double that of the first resonance. And uh, that's typical of uh, instruments like the saxophone that overload to the octave. Uh, what we can see also on this curve is that we have many resonances and many peaks of comparable amplitude. So this lets us uh, maybe predict some complexity in the behavior. And I'm going to uh, do a demonstration right now using a real saxophone of this complexity. So I'm going to use uh, the fingering of low C of the first register. And uh, what we can have first uh, as a, a sound that comes out of the instrument is no sound at all when I don't blow hard enough into the instrument. So you're going to hear something like don't hear much. That's the first kind of sound. And then we have the first note, which is a low C for this fingering. OK, so that's a low C. But without changing the fingering at all, I can obtain another note, which is the octave. So it's a C as well, but higher. So that's the second register of the instrument. And uh, we can also obtain quasi-periodic regimes. So uh, I hope this one is going to come out. And uh, it's a modulated amplitude regime, which goes wah, 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 wah. It doesn't work, of course. It worked before the presentation, I assure you. Um, but so that's, there's other kind of non-periodical regime. And I'm going to uh, do one last sound without changing the fingering at all. Uh, I'm going to produce a, a reed quack, uh, which is a much higher sound in pitch. And uh, that comes mainly from the reed itself. So that's all kinds of oscillating regimes that we can uh, obtain without changing the, the fingering of the instrument. So uh, to describe this complex behavior, we must uh, adopt specific tools that I'm going to talk about right now. Um, first, so to present this tool, I reformulate the equations of the model under the, the form of an algebra differential system such as this one, where the vector big X contains the variables, uh, the physical variables, P, U, and the read position X. And we have a function that's called F right there, uh, which depends on the control parameters, gamma and zeta. And um, I have used during my PhD two radically different methods of uh, numerical resolution. 
The first is time domain sim synthesis, and uh, it relies on discretizing the equations of the system uh, in such a manner that we obtain the value of the variables at a given time, depending on the values of the variable at previous instance. Uh, what this method produces is uh, what I'm going to call here complete signals. And what I mean by that is uh, we can see the transient phenomena uh, in the signals. This is an example of uh, internal pressure signal that I've produced using this method. And you can see here that we have a transient before uh, getting to the steady state regime where uh, we have periodic oscillations. Uh, in order to use this method to reveal the potential of sound production of the saxophone, we have to use it a number of times and uh, produce regime maps, as I call them here. Uh, what we do is we produce sounds for various values of uh, the control parameters that are on a grid. So the control parameters are the blowing pressure gamma here at the bottom. And on the left, we have the read opening parameter zeta. And um, for each pixel of the grid here, we've produced a sound and uh, three seconds of sound precisely. And the color of the pixel represents for this sound, which type of regime, which type of steady state regimes we obtain. So here in white, we have the equilibrium uh, that's what it's called when it doesn't make a sound. And then we have the first register in green. So that's for a large region of the control parameters. Uh, some points are red um, and that's for the second register. So the high C. And um, here we have blue points that denote quasi-periodical regimes. Um, then uh, to use this cartography, I suggest using them, them in a comparative manner to compare between several fingerings or several instruments. And uh, to compare them efficiently, uh, I suggest superposing them, superimposing them. And um, we're going to look now at the influence of the register hole on the regimes that are produced by the instrument. Um, on the left here, uh, so uh, the, the fingering here is a high C uh, for the, the first register. Um, and with the closed register hole, we have this cartography, which is the same as uh, the one I just showed. And then when we open the register hole, it changes the impedance of the resonator and uh, it gives this cartography. So what we can see here right away is that the red region corresponding to the second register is much larger when we open the register hole. And that's expected. Uh, musicians use the register hall to produce a higher register, in particular on the second register. Um, and when we superimpose the cartographies, uh, we can see another phenomenon is that by opening the register hall here, uh, we see that between the, so the background is with the register hole closed here and the foreground in contour uh, is with the register hole open. And what we can see is that the contour has shrunk a bit here. And so the threshold where oscillations appear um, has changed when opening the register hole. Let's look at another fingering now to see if uh, we have the same type of uh, features. And we look at the F sharp fingering. Uh, so always here in the background with the register hole closed, we see that there are green regions corresponding to the first register being produced. And then at the foreground, we can see that by opening the register hole, we have a red contour that uh, circles almost all of the map. And that denotes the fact that once again, for this fingering, opening the register hole favors the production of the second register. And so that uh, is a, a qualitative uh, coherence with the, the musician's experience, uh, which is that opening the register hole favors the production of second register. 
Uh, now I'm going to talk about the other uh, representation method, uh, numerical resolution method that I've used, and that's the harmonic balance method. Uh, it's fundamentally different in that uh, it relies on a hypothesis uh, of the periodicity of the regimes. So we assume the solutions of the equations to be periodic, uh, which allows us to expand them in Fourier series up to order h here. And what that entails is that the differential system becomes an algebraic system, uh, such as this one, where the unknowns are now the amplitudes of the harmonics of each variables here and the fundamental frequency there. Uh, so one of the advantage of this method is it gives access to the stability of the solution. In particular, uh, we can describe solutions that are unstable with this method, uh, which is uh, not possible or very difficult with the uh, time domain synthesis. However, uh, due to the hypothesis of periodicity, we cannot describe transients using the harmonic balance method. So that's a, a, a drawback here. Uh, with the harmonic balance, we use a continuation method, uh, which is the asymptotic numerical method of the system. Uh, we use uh, the MANLAB software, which is developed at LMA and freely available here at this address. And um, the continuation gives the evolution of the unknowns whenever we vary a parameter. Uh, in the case of the saxophone, the parameter that I will vary throughout this presentation will be, for instance, the blowing, the blowing pressure parameter, gamma. So the result of this method is represented by what I call a bifurcation diagram here. And um, I give a very simple example on a Van der Poel oscillator. The bifurcation diagram represents one characteristic of the oscillations, such as their amplitudes here, with respect to the continuation parameter, so in the case of the saxophone, the blowing pressure parameter, for instance. And what we see here is that for low values of this continuation parameter, we have no oscillations, the amplitude is zero there, and then there's a threshold here, a certain value of the continuation parameter where oscillations can appear, and then the amplitudes of the oscillation rise, 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 as the continuation parameters increases. Each point of the diagram corresponds to one solution of the system. Um, for instance, this point circle in red corresponds to this small amplitude solution that's almost sinusoidal. And then this point circled in blue corresponds to a much higher amplitude solution that is distorted and not sinusoidal at all. Um, the solutions that are displayed on the diagram can be stable if the lines, the, the branches are solid lines or unstable, such as the equilibrium right after the threshold here, the equilibrium solution of zero amplitude continues to exist, but it becomes unstable here. So now let's go to uh, the experimental devices that I've used during my PhD. And uh, first I'll talk about the instrumented mouthpiece. The instrumented mouthpiece is a regular saxophone mouthpiece that was modified to embed some sensors into it. First, we have a sensor that monitors control parameter of the musician, which is the blowing pressure. So it's a pressure probe that, that goes inside the mouth of the musician. And then we have two other sensors uh, that uh, measure physical variables, such as the pressure inside the mouthpiece uh, with another pressure probe here, or the displacement of the reed with an optical sensor here. And uh, what this allows to do is uh, in playing situation, we can compare the signals uh, of these variables and their oscillations to what we obtain using the numerical uh, methods. Another tool that I've used during my PhD is the CTTM impedance sensor. And uh, this allowed me to uh, develop a protocol and measure impedances for four different saxophones 
um, notes that the impedance measurements are performed without a mouthpiece on. So we just have the saxophone here adapted to the CTTM sensor without any mouthpiece. So in order to use these um, measurements into uh, the, the numerical synthesis pr procedure, um, we have to add a mouthpiece. And we do that by the transfer ma matrix method uh, by adding simply in post-processing a cylinder uh, that's approximately of the dimensions uh, of uh, a saxophone mouthpiece, a length of uh, 60 millimeter and a radius of six millimeters. So now that I've talked about the tools uh, that I've used, let's look at the dynamics of the saxophone and how we can describe it. First, I'm going to be interested in a very simple distinction uh, about the behavior of the saxophone. When can it make a sound? Under what conditions in terms of musician control parameters can oscillations exist? So that's what I'm interested in here. And uh, I'll reformulate this question as, what are the values of the control parameters gamma, so the blowing pressure, and zeta, the read opening at rest, that make any oscillation possible. And to start answering this question, uh, let's plot a bifurcation diagram. So here I've displayed the amplitude of the oscillation uh, with respect to the control parameter of the blowing pressure. So for one fixed value of zeta at first, for the high C fingering, which is a rather simple fingering, and here, what we see is that so far, low blowing pressure, the musician doesn't blow it hard enough into the instrument, so you have no oscillations. And then at some point, oscillations appear, and their amplitude increases, and then varies, and then varies. And there we arrive at a particular point, which is a limit point uh, that I call a fold bifurcation. And at this point, the oscillation cease to exist and for blowing pressure values above this value, we only have the equilibrium solution uh, that exists. Uh, so here we have found the limits of existence of the oscillations. Uh, the problem is we only have it for one value of the parameter zeta, and we'd like it for the whole plane gamma zeta. So what we're interested in here is um, the variation of the position of the control parameter of the fold bifurcation, depending on the read opening zeta. The first naive method we can use to solve this problem is uh, plotting several bifurcation diagrams for various values of zeta. And uh, for each one of them, we point to the fold and uh, we obtain this kind of curve. So I've plotted a lot of bifurcation diagrams there and there are the, the limit points, the fold. And we can see here on that plane that we obtain some kind of limits, but it's not very satisfa satisfactory because it's just a set of points. And also uh, the computational cost for such a naive method is uh, very high. Uh, it's very long to compute all of this bifurcations diagram. So we have to think a bit further and change our approach a little bit. What we are going to do is follow the fold itself. And uh, we know a characterization of the fold bifurcation. Um, and this characterization is that the Jacobian matrix of the system admits a null eigenvalue. So what we do here is we extend the system after harmonic balance, and we add the constraint that we must stay on a fold bifurcation. And uh, this constraint is uh, translated here as an eigenvalue equation where we have the eigenvector that's associated to the null eigenvalue here, PF. Uh, of course, 
we had another continuation parameter. We had the blowing pressure gamma, and here we are going to add the read opening parameter zeta. So we can uh, find the location of the fault in the gamma zeta plane. And we also add a condition of norm on the eigenvector. So what's the result of this? Uh, I've displayed here in red the curve attained by fold continuation. And uh, what we can see here is that, uh, well, first it connects the dots that we had found uh, on the various bifurcation diagrams. And also, if I look at the figure from above, which I've done, I've displayed on the right here, it's a, a view from above, we can see that the red line outlines the existence of oscillation. Outside the red line, oscillations are impossible. And inside the red line, we see the blue lines that uh, corresponds to uh, the bifurcation diagram. So there are oscillation in this region. So we have plotted by continuing the fault bifurcation, the limit of existence of the oscillations. And um, it's a much more efficient method because we can obtain the red line without calculating all the bifurcation diagrams. So it's much, much more efficient in terms of uh, computational costs. Then let's look at a more subtle distinction between um, the regimes, so between two types of os oscillation. For this fingering of the saxophone, so the high C of the first register, uh, we have two types of oscillations. The standard regime, where the internal pressure is positive for a long time and then becomes negative briefly. And that happens for the low values of the blowing pressure parameter gamma. And then we have another regime which is called inverted. And for the inverted regime, the pressure is negative for a long time and it becomes positive briefly. And that happens for high values of the blowing pressure parameter. And now the question is, kind of the same as the one before, is what are the values of the control parameters gamma and zeta that lead to each one of these regimes? So to answer that question, let's look at first two bifurcation diagrams for two different values of the read opening parameter zeta. Here for a low value of the, blowing of the read opening parameter, uh, zeta equal equals 0.4, uh, we have a continuous transition between the standard and inverted motion. You see that the branch here is always stable, always solid line between the standard and inverted uh, region of the diagram. Um, when we increase the read opening parameter zeta here on the right, zeta equals 0.7, we have a different, qualitatively different behavior where the standard and inverted motions are separated here by two fold bifurcations. And so there's a zone here of instability and unstable uh, solutions on the branch that separates between the standard and inverted motion. And so the question that I ask here is what value of zeta separates between these two qualitatively different behaviors? Uh, and in order to find it, we are going to follow this or this internal fault bifurcation point. And the result is displayed here. So what we have there is uh, some bifurcation diagrams for, for reference to understand what happens. And uh, the result of the fault continuation procedure in red and here we see that the two fault bifurcations, the two limit points, get closer and closer and closer as zeta decreases. And at some point, they collapse together and disappear. And that's called the cusp bifurcation. And it happens uh, at uh, around zeta equals 0.48 here. So that's the limit point that we were looking for. And um, I, I'm going to say here that uh, this is the first instance of observation of a cusp bifurcation on uh, a musical instrument model. Uh, of course, it's well known in the dynamical systems world in general, but it's the first observation on a 
on a musical instrument model uh, to, uh, that I know of, at least. So now that we've explained what happens on a high fingering, let's look at another fingering. And uh, I'm sure the saxophone players among you know that uh, when you play the saxophone, some fingerings are more demanding than others. And that's the case for the low fingerings. The low fingerings are harder to control and uh, the regimes that can be produced with them are much more valuable. And um, so let's now look at the low B fingering, which is almost at the bottom of the first register and try to describe what happens uh, on this fingering. So uh, I've put a bifurcation diagram here, but I'm going to launch an animation so that we can see more precisely what it represents. There it is. Hop. So let me describe the figure first. Um, uh, I I have the, the bifurcation diagrams here on the bottom right. Um, and uh, the, the circle is going to go through the branches. And so we're going to look at the waveform of all the solutions that are inside this bifurcation diagrams. Uh, and uh, as the blowing pressure vary, you are going to see the waveform um, change and the amplitude of the harmonics change as well. And here, what I've displayed on the bottom left panel is the ratio uh, of the duration where the pressure is uh, negative over the duration where it's positive. And so here we have at first a standard regime where the pressure is negative briefly and positive for a long time. So that's a low ratio right there. And that's characteristic of a standard two-step motion. And now I'm going to animate this diagram and you can see the waveform change as we increase the blowing pressure here. And as we go through the branch, you're going to see there that the negative pressure episodes gets longer and longer here, gets longer and longer. As we transition towards an inverted two-step motion. And here what we have is clearly an inverted two-step motion where the pressure is negative for a long time and positive briefly. And then there are two other branches that I'm going to talk about right now. And they are fundamentally different oscillating regimes. So these are the two branches that I'm interested in now. Um, and what we see here on the waveform uh, for the start of this uh, branch is that we have two episodes of uh, negative pressure per period. And uh, this type of regime is called a double two-step regime where uh, the pressure becomes negative twice per period. And so as I increase the blowing pressure, we have the double two-step regime that transitions continuously into a second register regime. So you can hear that here, uh, the fundamental frequency has changed. Um, it has doubled actually. So we have the octave of all the other regimes. So that's a second register regime. And then we have the last branch that is also a double, a kind of double two-step regime. But here the, positive, the pressure becomes positive twice briefly um, in the, the period. So that's called an inverted double two-step uh, regime. And um, so, so now the question that I ask about these regimes is, uh, okay, we can find them on the model, uh, so that's well and good, but do they really exist? And can we find them in playing situation with a musician? And uh, to find out, uh, I've used the instrument in mouthpiece and measured uh, the position of the reed here. So when we observe the periodic oscillations of the instruments uh, by the, the displacement of the reed, so the displacement of the reed is analogous to uh, the pressure and uh, 
here we can recognize that we have a standard two-step motion where the read is open for a long time and then closed for a sh short time. So uh, it's like when the pressure is positive for a long time and then negative for a short time. We also find with the instrument in mouthpiece a double two-step regime, an inverted double two-step regime here where the read opens briefly twice. And then of course we have the inverted two-step regime where the read opens briefly once. So all of these regimes that uh, we've observed on the model, they actually are um, easy to observe ac experimentally on the same fingering, so the low B fingering. And what's more is that uh, when you take an instrument in mouthpiece and uh, you play it by increasing the blowing pressure prog progressively, uh, you see that the regimes appear in a certain order that is standard, then double two-step regime, then some second register, and then the inverted double two-step regime, and then the inverted regime. And uh, this order is actually coherent with the bifurcation diagram uh, that we find um, using the, the continuation method and the harmonic balance. So now uh, let's look at virtual prototyping. And um, we've analyzed the behavior of the model. Um, now, how can we use all these tools to uh, apply them to uh, instrument making problematics and to get closer to the playing experience of the musician? And um, what I mean by that, I'm going to explain how the bifurcation diagrams that I've presented up until here are limited. The question is, for the limitation of the bifurcation diagrams, what happens if several regimes are stable for a given value of the control parameters? Which regime will then be produced in playing situation? And uh, the bifurcation diagrams does not give an answer to this question which is actually an interesting question because as you can see here on this bifurcation diagram for the low uh, D-sharp fingering, you have multi-stability zones where several regimes are stable that make up for almost all of the range of the blowing pressure parameter gamma. So this is a very important phenomenon. It's, uh, it's very important to know what happens here. Uh, what could happen when the instrument is played by a musician. So to answer the question, let's use the time domain synthesis. And what I'm going to do first is uh, use blowing pressure ramps here. And I've displayed in blue, overlaid to the bifurcation diagram, the amplitude of the time domain signal here. So at first, we start with a zero pressure and we increase it progressively. So we have no sound up until this threshold where oscillations appear and those oscillations are first register oscillations. So we follow the green branch all the way through the multi-stability zones and when it disappears, we go back to the equilibrium. And then starting from this high blowing pressure, we decrease progressively gamma. And when we decrease progressively gamma, we can see on this diagram that the path we take is very different. And this the history, this phenom phenomenon that is highly, uh, that is due, directly due to the multi-stability of the regimes. And depending on which branch we are following at first, it's the one branch that we're going to follow until the end of the multi-stability zones. So, We've found that it depends where you're coming from, but blowing pressure ramps are not very realistic excitations. And uh, we can ask ourselves what happens with more realistic control parameter profiles, uh, such as one that a musician could apply to an instrument. For instance, if the musician starts blowing into the instrument, uh, the blowing pressure parameter is going to go from zero to whatever final value it takes, um, maybe not instantaneously. 
it's going to take some time that uh, I represent with the parameter tau gamma here. And the question that I ask is, inside a multi-stability zone, this, does this duration affect the final regime obtained? And uh, to figure it out, we're going to use the time domain synthesis for a set of value of final uh, blowing pressure and different attack times to gamma and classify the regime that we obtain in each case. So here I've displayed a cartography where gamma is at the bottom here the final value of the blowing pressure parameter. And uh, on the left here vertically, we have the attack time. So at the bottom of the cartography, those signals were produced for slow attack times. And here at the top, it's the fastest attacks. And I'm placed inside a multi-stability zone between the equilibrium here and the first register. And what we see here is that for low value of final gamma, we only have equilibrium as displayed by the blank, the white dots here. And here we have a region where for one given value of the final blowing pressure parameter, we have different regimes depending on the value of uh, tau gamma on the speed of the attack. And for a slow attack, we obtain equilibrium, so no sound. And for a fast attack, we obtain some sound. And so the oscillations are of the first register in that case. And there's even a tendency that we can see here is that um, it's always the slowest attacks that produce the equilibrium and always the fastest, the fastest that uh, produce the first register regimes here. So that's a general rule in this multi-stability zones. But does it work that way for all the other zones, in particular for the zones where two oscillating regimes uh, cohabitate? And what I've done here is go to a multi-stability zone between the first and the second register. And what we see here is on the left, so we have only the first register, and there we enter the multi-stability zone. And here again, depending on the attack time, we can have both the second register regime or the first register regime with a particular value of tau gamma that seems to favor the production of the first register here. And what's weird here is for these value of final gamma, we are still in the multi-stability zone, but we only see the second register. So the question I'm asking here is uh, how come, how can we explain the fact that Two regimes are stable, but we only obtain one. And to explain that, I'm going to look at the attraction basins. And the attraction basin of a given uh, regime is the region of the phase space that leads to this regime. So it's located around the limit cycle, uh, around the oscillation cycle. And uh, we can see that uh, depending on the initial condition of the system, uh, we are going to converge towards one or the other stable regime when we're in the multi-stability zone. And here, so on the right, we have the bifurcation diagram. And on the left, we have the attraction basin in the projection that I've chosen uh, because uh, it allows for cl clear visual separation of the limit cycles and the attraction basins as clear as possible, which is P1, P2, and P2 point, the model pressures and the one model pressure derivative. And what I'm gonna do here is go through the diagram. So here the blue line represents the current blowing pressure value and it's going to increase. And as it increases, you can see the attraction basins deform. So here, only the first register is stable. And we are going to enter the multi-stability region between the first and the second register. Here, you see that we have two cohabitating uh, attraction basins. And these attraction basins, oh yeah, I forgot to specify that they were obtained by time domain synthesis by varying the initial condition. And so these are all points uh, through which the time domain synthesis has passed uh, 
before converging, if the point is red, it was before converging to the second register. And if the point is green, it's before converging to the first register here in green. And so as I increase gamma, you can see that the, the track distance changed. And here is a good example of what I was uh, mentioning earlier, is you can see that um, the attraction basin of the second register is very large. There are a lot of points that are red, while the first register uh, attraction basins is only a few points. So uh, what that tells us is that uh, in some way, the second register is more stable than the first register for this value. Uh, there are very few initial conditions that lead to the first register, while there are a lot that lead to the second register. So that's an explanation of what we've observed on the cartography. And uh, here I'm going to say that uh, this phenomenon has led us to develop another tool to explain the instrument making choices. Taking into account the multi-stability, we take a grid of control parameters, gamma and zeta. And for each one of them, each one of the couples, uh, we synthesize sound for a few attack times. Here, three attack times to gamma. And uh, here, for this control parameter couple, at the top, for fast attack times, we have first register that was produced. Here, in the middle, for an intermediate attack times, we had second register. And here, for a very long attack time, we had equilibrium that was produced. And um, what this does, it, it allows to take into account the multi-stability phenomenon in the description of the global behavior of the saxophone. So let's apply this tool to explaining and uh, investigating a prescription um, by Benaid in 68. Uh, which stated that the oscillation was favored at a frequency um, for which the impedance was large at the harmonics of that frequency. So the way I interpret that uh, prescription is that the first register being around the first resonance frequency, well, a bit lower, but around the first resonance frequency, if we have perfectly harmonic resonance, um, uh, i.e. Uh, perfectly harmonic peaks, we are going to have the largest possible impedance at all the harmonics of the first register. So the first register may be favored in that case. And to test that hypothesis, I'm going to vary artificially, so that's an example of virtual prototyping, the harmonicity of the second peak. So the ratio between the, uh, the second resonance frequency and the first resonance frequency. What I see here is that for the measured harmonicity, um, which is not integer, so not perfectly harmonic, we have F2 equals 2.065 F1. And um, we see that uh, for an integer harmonicity, so perfectly harmonic two first two resonances, we have more second register here, more red dots on the right than on the left. So that seems surprising because uh, I'd have expected that for uh, integer harmonicity, the, ha the oscillation would be favored uh, at the first resonance frequency. So let's check on other, uh, other fingerings what happens. And what I did there is for seven low fingerings of the instruments, I varied uh, F2 over F1, produced a cartography, and um, looked at how much first register and how much second register was produced. And by counting this, uh, I was able to compute ratios of production of the first and second register. And each cartography for each fingering makes for one point in these curves, where here, for instance, you see that you have less first register than second register. And on the right, <coughs> you can see the curves summarizing these results with the Benet's prescription with integer uh, ratio between the resonances in blue and the measured inharmonicities in black here. 
and the maximum of production of the first register in green. So let's look at the harmonicity that corresponds to the maximum of production of the first register. And what can, we can see here is that the triangles all correspond to harmonicities that are slightly above two. And um, also they're non-integer and they vary a bit like the harmonicity that we can measure depending on the, on the fingering here. The measured inharmonicity is displayed by the, the vertical black bars. And so this refines the interpretation that we can make of Benade's conjecture. Uh, I'm going to conclude very quickly about my contributions. So we the possibilities of a sound production uh, by the saxophone using a combination of numerical tools and the experimental validation. Uh, developed some uh, new efficient and robust tools taking into account multi-stability, for instance. And uh, during my PhD, I've also, so I didn't mention it today, but um, studied the influence of uh, neglecting the contact between the reed and the mouthpiece, and also uh, reflected on a numerically aided conception process by a numerical optimization. So the musical instrument as a dynamical system gives the opportunity to develop new approaches to apply to instrument making problems. Not replacing, of course, the classical methods, but uh, maybe completing them. And uh, these methods allow to access the behavior of the virtual prototype, uh, such as the ease of playing, the intonation, the timber. So we're not there yet, but uh, there's the potential by accessing the oscillations to uh, uh, access high-end descriptor descriptors like this one. And the numerical studies are fast and reproducible. Uh, we can apply the approach to other instruments, uh, of course, reed instruments, but al also brass with uh, adapting the concepts that I've presented. And uh, the, main, the, the main question that remains is the predictive nature of the models. Uh, whether they, are, they can be coherent with the musician's experience uh, and uh, how well can they represent the sounds of the instrument uh, depending on the musician's action. Uh, I've been a bit long, so I'm going to stop now and take any questions from the audience if you have any. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci. Merci bien. Hop. Je vais arrêter.